Uh, you are welcome to do it. As our okay. MC, you can do that. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for joining folks. We're waiting for uh, additional attendees to get logged in here. So we'll be just another moment or two. We're just letting in additional attendees. So if you could give us another moment or two, that would be terrific. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. We're just waiting for additional attendees to be let in. So we'll be commencing in just a, just a minute or two. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pat Gallagher, and I'm the CEO of Voltron Therapeutics, and I'll be the moderator today. Uh, Voltron is a biotech company developing a vaccine platform to be used in oncology, infectious disease, and importantly, emerging infectious disease. This is not a company call at all, but I think a little historical perspective of how we got here is, is germane to today's discussion. We licenses technology out of Mass General and the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center, and really like the concept because it is target agnostic. And we'll talk, I think, about that today and how that can be important in preparedness moving forwards, and for moving forward rather. In other words, it was created to address existing and new targets and not just handle situations in a one-off fashion. And it is set up so that you learn from every vaccine you develop and that can be applied to the next one. So I thank you all for taking your time to join us for this important discussion. In April, we held a similar briefing and there was an overwhelming desire to have a part two. So today we're excited to bring our expert panel back together with an important new addition, Dr. Michelle Williams. And we will discuss how we can bring the pandemic to an endemic by bringing together science policy and public health initiatives. And we'll also talk about the lessons we've learned from COVID to plan better for future pandemics. The agenda today is pretty straightforward. Uh, Congressman Jim McGovern will give opening remarks. We'll introduce the panelists. Uh, they will walk through their thoughts and provide insights uh, along with the slide deck. And then we will have Q&A at the end. Please feel free to submit questions along the way and we will get to as many of them as, as possible. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Jim McGovern to give our opening remarks. Congressman McGovern was born and raised in Worcester, Mass, and was first elected to Congress in 1996. Congressman McGovern serves as the chair of the powerful House Rules Committee and is a member of the House Agriculture Committee. And important to today's discussion, he also serves as the co-chair for the Congressional Study Group of Public Health. Congressman McGovern, we know you're having a a busy week and a busy day. So thank you so much for your time today. Well, well, thank you. And I apologize for being a little bit late where, where uh, the president was up here and I've been in a meeting with the speaker and, uh, and we've been in some meetings where we have to check our phones. So um, anyway, we're, we're making progress. Uh, so that's a good thing. But I'm honored to join all of you today uh, to hear from experts from the uh, Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Harvard Medical School uh, and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And understanding uh, what more must be uh, done to move ourselves um, out of this pandemic, I think is a critical question that we must answer. Uh, vaccines play a vital role in this, not just in distribution, access and equity, but um, communicating how they work, uh, why we need them, how we innovate in vaccine development are all key. 
it is truly inter, uh, the intersection of science, policy, and public health that must be understood and harnessed to ensure the best outcome for all of us. Our health, safety, and lives truly depend on it. As we near the two-year mark of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must plan also, uh, we, we, must, we must also uh, continue conversations about future pandemic preparedness. In particular, the pandemic has reminded us of the important need to invest in public health systems at all levels of government, local, state, and federal. The beginning, uh, the beginning of the pandemic showed that our local public health infrastructure is woefully underfunded and had been neglected for far too long. Government plays a vital role in this work, and I'm here to help, as are my colleagues. Uh, we know we must implement policies to protect our public health, communicate and coordinate with all levels of government and the American people, and provide funding and other resources uh, to enable the, and accelerate the best innovations, such as in vaccines, and the most effective first response to, to outbreaks. The collaboration of the public and private sector, sectors during the pandemic, including scientists, researchers, doctors, and government, who all mobilized and collaborated to develop and bring a vaccine uh, to Americans within a year of acquiring uh, the genetic code of the coronavirus was really truly remarkable. Uh, there are valuable lessons we've learned in this effort. We know there are ways uh, to be prepared for future pandemics and shorten the timeline to bringing solutions to the public, preventing transmission, sickness and death, and we must apply them going forward. So today I look forward to hearing from uh, uh, Drs. Michelle Williams, Mark Kuznansky and Michael uh, Callahan on what, we, uh, what we've learned and how we apply this knowledge to maximize science, policy, and public health to be best prepared for future outbreaks. I am uh, an eager, I'm eager to partner with all of you, uh, as is the, our entire delegation, and, uh, and we look forward to uh, supporting you uh, as you try to accomplish uh, the goals that I've just outlined. I wanna thank you again for inviting me uh, to be here today. And uh, let me just say, I'm just proud to be from Massachusetts with all this brain power and expertise. And you've all been on the cutting edge of so many important things. So thanks so much for having me. And I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Congressman McGovern. Those are very powerful remarks and really set the stage very well for us to, to move ahead. And, and uh, I'm the one who doesn't live in Massachusetts full time. So I guess I'm excluded from the uh, the, the big brain power, <laughs> the rest that's on the call. Right. Um, at any rate, I'd love to introduce the panelists. Um, we have Dr. Mark Posnanski with us, and Mark is a medical innovator whose work bridges academic discovery and clinical care. I think that's a really important point because Dr. Posnanski is in the clinic every month and has been upfront and personal with COVID and COVID patients in the hospital and in the ICU. So he brings a very unique perspective. He started the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center in 2008 and uh, continues to be the director of it, leading a team of researchers, investigators, postdoc fellows, et cetera, to really address key questions regarding new therapeutics and vaccines. And in fact, the VIC currently has nine vaccines and immunotherapies in development, including a self-assembling T-cell-based COVID directed vaccine. Dr. Posnanski is the scientific founder of Celtaxis, Aparasis, Voltron Therapeutics, and uh, Vicapsis. So we're really pleased to have Mark with us. We also have Dr. Michelle Williams, and we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Williams. She is the Dean of Faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Angelopoulos Professor in Public Health and International Development, uh, which is a joint faculty appointment of both the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Dr. Williams is, inter is an internationally renowned epidemiologist and a public health scientist. Uh, she has 500 scientific articles to her credit was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2016 and 2020, was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor and recognized by PR Week as one of the top health influencers of the year. We're really pleased to have Dr. Williams' public health uh, uh, perspective here. And finally, we have Dr. Michael Callahan. Dr. Callahan is the president of the Division of Cellular Therapeutics at United Therapeutics. 
importantly, he's the director of clinical translation at the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center. He's an attending physician in infectious disease at Mass General. Michael is also the former COVID advisor to Asper at HHS. He's the former director for DARPA Biodefense Medical Countermeasures, and finally is a former special advisor for OSTP and NSC under both uh, President Obama and President Bush. And with that, I will turn the floor over to the panel to discuss their, their thoughts and uh, share slides with you. So thank you, everybody. So uh, I'm going to take it up here with this first slide and say that it's very important at this point in a pandemic to just understand the scale of the problem that we're facing. Uh, the, th these numbers are not meant to be sort of, in a way, directly comparable because whatever happened in 1918 and 1919 was a different type of pandemic at a different time in the, in the country's history. But the, the, the point is it's the order of magnitude of death that has been caused here. Uh, we're, we're in the same order of magnitude. Uh, with regards to deaths in the 1918-1919 pandemic with influenza, as we are with the deaths associated with COVID-19 2020 to 2021. And it's, it's a salutary point which we must take into account. There's, it, it tells us there's a, still a long way to go because despite being a little over 100 years later, we're still facing this, these massive challenges that a, a pandemic a viral, respiratory viral pandemic can cause for our country, for individually, socially, economically, uh, public health and, and so forth. So I think the poignancy of this slide is really to do with the order of magnitude more than any, not more than even the specific numbers with regards to we still have a ways to go to prepare for pandemics in the future and to deal with the current pandemic. If I could have the next slide. Uh, the, the, the fundamental thing that this all comes down to is the virus that causes all of this havoc in our society. And although we talk about, you know, we, we're, we're working based on the science that we're developing from day to day, the science of viruses has been around for decades. And we understand actually the virus playbook is all about transmission, the virus spreads from one person to another, the virus replicates in our bodies very, very rapidly indeed, spreading from whether we pick it up in our nose or our throat, uh, potentially down into our lungs. And then that the impact on the person that's infected varies from everything from uh, a complete absence of symptoms to death and from the condition itself. And that that's a virus playbook that's been written over and over again. And we have to face facts that, that that virus playbook hasn't changed in millions of years. And it certainly hasn't changed in the last hundred years. We also know that viruses change, in, they're capable of changing because they don't accurately replicate their own uh, genetic material. They, they, they actually play on the fact that if they change their genetic material, they may actually make, make themselves better at transmitting and better at replicating in the host. And that again has been known for decades. They're also not sitting ducks. When they infect us, they're not just going, come on, bring on your, bring on your vaccine. We'll, 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 we'll be a sitting duck for that. They actually have mechanisms to evade an immune system that they've grown up with over millions of years. They, they have co-evolved with, with mammals on this planet, including us, to actually work out ways to avoid our immune systems. And again, not recently found out, that's not one year or two year old science, that's decades of science of understanding that viruses are not sitting ducks and may evade the immune system. And then this point about mutation is it's a, it's simply named since Charles Darwin talked about the uh, evolution, which is that uh, in the case of viruses, the thing that gives them their competitive advantage is the, their ability to replicate faster and faster up to a limit 
but certainly if one variant is replicating twice a minute and the next variant is re replicating three times a minute, the one that can replicate three times a minute is going to beat out the one that's replicating two times a minute. And then we're struck, we're stuck as, as people who can be infected with the virus is, is that one that's replicating faster now capable of spreading faster, overcoming your immunity faster and potentially causing more disease uh, in the population. So these are well-established foundational components of viruses and the respiratory viruses that we fear most in the context of pandemics. It's not new science, it's being refined as a result of our understanding of COVID-19, but we have to face up to this aspect or these aspects of the virus in order to deal with them um, most importantly. The last point here is that viruses are not one trick ponies. They don't just have spike protein in this case of COVID-19 sitting on their surface. They have a machine underneath, which is about four other proteins that do other things to keep the virus going and doing what it needs to do, which is transmit and replicate. And I think that's where we have to broaden our view beyond the initial approaches, which only target spike, which was an appropriate first response, but now going forward, we need to modify. Next slide. Oh, I should ask if anyone else on the on our panel want to interact or, or add anything. And I, I think on this slide, I want to segue to Michael on the current state of vaccines in the in in this setting that all the vaccines that are currently out there target that one component of the virus, the spike protein. Um, we know that obviously vaccination is an extremely important way of controlling the, 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 the um, disease and that vaccination above all and so-called shots in arms in that case is the most, thing, most important thing that we want to accomplish nationally and internationally. But at the moment, we really play a whack-a-mole approach that, you know, as a variant of myages, we have to go after it. And we really want to approach this in a more strategic way, looking to cover much more of the, of the uh, landscape of the COVID-19 virus with a vaccine than just a whack-a-mole approach. And I turn to Michael to nuance that. No, you're absolutely <laughs> You're absolutely right, Mark. The, one of the key elements is our contracting process and our, the way that we manage the funding of these vaccines is so delayed that we're inevitably fighting the last virus. So even as we sit here today, um, the Congress, excuse me, the appropriations are directed at Delta rather than Delta Plus and these viruses, which we've been successful at predicting their emergence. So we shouldn't just react to the last war, we should be more proactive. But great points, Mark, over. Next yeah, slide. and Mark, let, oh, me, let me also add uh, to, Mar uh, to, to Michael's important point, we should really reimagine what we mean when we talk about preparedness and response. And we have to have a long view but that long view should be informed by the historical um, uh, mistakes and successes that we've had. You know, your first slide about did you know um, is provocative. We had a hundred years to prepare um, to not um, have the preventable losses of life that we had. And one thing I would add to your did you know slide is did you know that we lost um, according to the WHO, over 100,000 healthcare providers so far in this global pandemic. And um, these are important lessons. So looking back, as you have done in that first slide, to position us to take a long view that is really necessary for response and preparedness is important. And of course, the spectacular fruits of science vaccines are incredibly important. But vaccines themselves, not enough. Vaccination, getting those wonderful fruits of basic science into the arms of individuals for preparedness and response to this current and future pandemics will require the kind of collaboration that Congressman McGovern spoke about at the top of the series, the event. Thank you. Could we have the next slide? 
This is from Michael, if you want. Very good, Mark. And, and Michelle, thanks so much for that comment. And we'll try to, you know, it's very important that an underlying theme in all of this is that we should make vaccines for all viruses present and future. And that is within the technical capability of the United States academic and industry. And secondarily, we should make sure everybody benefits from the vaccines, that they are equally distributed and equally efficacious to all people. And we'll show that by example in the next couple of slides. So I'll be brief. If we look at it, the term the kill shot for immunity actually comes from a US federal program, which was so good that it was acquired by a commercial company and, and became a proprietary product. As we sit here today, there are in silica systems that can actually produce virus uh, protection against viruses of the future. This is critically important as we home in on vaccines for HIV, for dengue, and certainly for hepatitis C. So that term actually means something as part of the program record and can be found under parts of the DARPA portfolio. Okay, It again was acquired for proprietary programs, but we use it to set up our storyboard for the next two minutes. Contemporary vaccine life cycles really need to start with the problem prediction, and that starts with an early warning system. We call that surveillance, and what that might conjure up is images of people chasing down viruses in ducks and bats and the things like that, and certainly that is traditional surveillance. Surveillance in these modern times, though, really demands that we look aggressively at high probability and high consequence areas where viruses emerge. And that really relies on an international collaborative network where there's mutual benefit from the collaboration. That means that Indonesia, China, Russia benefit in terms of their public health and the continuity of their economies by working with American and other Western interests. These surveillance systems persist now quietly, even in adversarial nations. They do not exist in a forceful and energetic way between our own CDC and others. So we need to re-engage those, okay? The second point related to surveillance is when we have a small brush fire developing, a small outbreak of tens of people, it should trigger an alarm. Because our Chinese colleagues, even our Indonesia colleagues and our communities of physicians and scientists that we have trained, our nation has trained throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, they know deviation from normal. They can tell you that we have a problem here in rural Ghana, we have a problem here in rural Hubei province, we have a problem here in any number of complicated countries. So. We need to make sure that we go there. And the reason why we need to respond collaboratively and forcefully is not just for humanitarian response, but it's in our own national health security interest. We need to increase our response time. And we can only do that if we become experts in these diseases wherever they first emerge. So surveillance is coupled very closely to an early understanding of the virus and the directions in which it's mutating away from a therapy that we're trying to produce here on American soil. We can anticipate as proven by every single pandemic that there will be evolution on the virus. The evolution will be in response to the virus's first encounter with humans. It'll be in response to its first encounter with drugs and early vaccines and with the diversity of people that it will encounter from community to community. That process is accelerated on a grand scale in modern times. So before we were, these transitions would happen at the speed of a clipper ship. Now you can get anywhere in the world except for Antarctica in 17 hours, usually on a direct flight. So we must maximize those response times and also be able to give us every advantage to predict the variants that will actually be created. And using an area of unique American innovation to do our in silica prediction and couple that with computer-based learning and with collaborations internationally to make vaccines at accelerated timelines and monoclonals as well, so that we'll be ready when these viruses come to American soil and we can export these solutions to keep these problems small, to keep them as small fires, not massive wildfires. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Okay, my second slide before we turn to Michelle's discussion of the vaccine inequities and the diversity and the, and the steps that really matter is to understand that the US has almost everything it needs to be successful. This country was rated among the international number one performers for readiness for pandemics, yet we rank 38 in terms of impact relative to our prosperity in terms of our medical literacy and the robustness of our medical countermeasures. So the realignment of things we already have can make us reestablish that first position. Okay, what would it take? The first thing is what we call is the green card, is restoring our foreign research collaborations by doing the things that have saved us in prior pandemics, the ones that were never big, did not get big for a reason. It's because these institutions, these hospitals across the US have mentored and trained physician leaders of foreign governments who go back home and are promoted to ministries of health. And we are all on speed dial. At the beginning of these outbreaks, physicians in rural China were calling physicians that had trained them 20 years ago across the US and started to send an alarm up that got things moving here in the US, particularly in the ASPR and the Center for Disease Control. Okay, so we do need to reestablish that connectivity based on trust, transparency, and mutual, uh, mutual benefits to each of those nations and those physician and healthcare communities. Point two of these four points is to really reinvigorate surveillance and to do so in places not where it is easy, which is what we do now, we surveil countries that wanna work with the US. We need to surveil countries that are difficult, adversarial and suspicious of US intrusion and collaboration. So we should not go where it is easy. We should go where it's where these viruses uh, statistically are likely to come from, places that are mucky, malarial, and mischievous, you know, full of problems in the field. That's where we need to send our best people, not the people that are free to go, but our very best scientists and collaborators. Thirdly, is resuming these relationships with foreign laboratories allows us to do an amazing offer that the US government has made to partner labs all over the world is to get rid of gain of function. We've proposed programs in our own national academies where we offer an ensemble of toolkits that allows you to develop drugs and vaccines against future lethal viruses without actually creating those viruses. It's worth a minute of the, the technical uh, explanation here. When different labs, both here on US soil, in Russia, Australia, China, and elsewhere, made more dangerous COVID viruses, more, excuse me, more dangerous coronaviruses, they would purposely make the spike protein more sticky and make those viruses more infectious. That same technology and all of the results that we needed could have been done by doing the same process, but putting it into a yeast. And those plans have been sitting on the American playbook since 2010. But unfortunately, due to proprietary issues and some of the needs of academic investigators to produce stunning papers, they're not sharing these yeast-based things. So these yeast-based expression systems. So lastly, is updating our vaccine development tools to look for all sources of origin, be it mother nature or naturally occurring, error, meaning bio oops, is what we call it in the intelligence community, which means it wasn't intended. It is an escaped virus or bacteria or fungi that got out of an industrial alternative fuel plant someplace in South Africa, Czechoslovakia, Russia, China, and elsewhere. There are thousands of these labs and thousands of opportunity to have bio error create a pandemic or other consequential outbreak of the future. And lastly, purposefully engineered viruses, either for gain of function, which we just talked about, or something ever more nefarious. And we'll end with just telling you that this country has developed toolkits to look for the tool marks of human engineering on these viruses. And we need to advance those so that they are operational and can help us sort naturally occurring from erroneous release from nefarious act. With that, I'll turn it over to Jean Williams to discuss these issues and how we can weave them together for an informed public health policy. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, all that you say is so fundamentally important for what we have to do to unlock the potential, the, the fruits that science can bring to providing the preparedness and the response that we need for uh, viral uh, threats. Let me address the issues around um, vaccine hesitancy. And I wanna start out by saying that our fear or fear of vaccines have many origins. Um, and this is not a new issue. The concerns, the hesitancy, the fears around vaccine are rooted in disillusionment, disillusionment with modern medicine, science, and government, as well as rumors and misinformation that is now able to be amplified um, by the speed and the reach of social media. There's also a concern that there is a much uh, disparity in the distribution and the uptake of vaccines. And many African-American, Hispanic and Native American um, residents have a deep sense of distrust, some of which is um, justified given US history and the public health services history of not serving uh, these populations um, in the most appropriate and humane and ethical ways. And so because of the long reach and history of medical racism and the long memory of medical racism without reckoning with these harms and past traumas, there's also a contribution to vaccine hesitancy in these populations. It goes without saying as well that there has been a politicization of the public health measures, vaccines, mask wearing, um, and other uh, measures in response to this um, pandemic that have complicated our response. But focusing on vaccine hesitancy, it is clear when you look at results from the Pew Center survey recently done in August, that while 86% of Democrats have received at least one shot of the vaccine, as many as six, only 60% of Americans identifying as Republicans has. And this politicization of vaccines and other public health measure, measures are complicating factors to how we respond um, and um, control this pandemic. I wanna get back to vaccine hesitancy and to also say that this is not new. Over 200 years ago, when the world was actually going through its medical revolution and advance, we were um, seeing the same kinds of hesitancy to the uh, vaccine um, um, a, as a historical um, activity. So how do we address vaccine hesitancy? The first thing that we have to do as a nation and as a globe is to be very clear, to be very consistent in messaging the safety of vaccines. Messaging very clearly and consistently the safety of vaccines is absolutely the first and fundamental key. And in fact, I'm a huge fan of the work of the Vaccine Confidence Project, which was founded by Heidi, Heidi Larson, who shares information for a broad range of um, um, the population, from those who are very highly educated to those with very uh, limited um, access to advanced education about the safety of vaccines, bringing forward science-based, um, evidence-based information about the vaccines. Second important response is understanding why and to be empathetic, why people might be hesitant to the vaccines um, and, and, and essentially design intentionally human-centered approaches for messaging and communicating why vaccines are important, what vaccines has accomplished in preventing and even eliminating uh, diseases that have robbed populations of health and wellness in their lives, and to enable and empower an army of messengers to talk about vaccines in local communities. It will help to be exquisitely hyper-local in meeting vaccine hesitant, vaccine concerned individuals where they are in their communities with messengers that they relate to, to understand and appreciate the importance of vaccines in preventing past morbidities and preventing death 
that are preventable by vaccines, as well as future vaccines, the science and the regulatory processes that go to ensure that they're safe. I also want to um, say that one very key aspect is to drive home the point that the scientists and the communities that bring forth vaccines are diverse. For example, um, our Harvard Chan professor Kismekia Kovic is an individual, an African-American woman who was one of the instrumental scholars and scientists involved in bringing about the Moderna vaccine. If we can build an awareness that there's a diverse cadre of individuals representing all walks of life, representing all race and ethnicity who are engaged in the scientific enterprise that brings forth vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics that are important tools in spreading the capacity to improve population health, we are doing much better in countering the issues of hesitancy. Finally, on a macro level, I want to say that this is our moment. This is our moment to address the woeful underinvestment in public health. You know, all told, we're spending about four and a half billion dollars less on public health than we need to, to provide adequate levels of protection, prevention, and care. And the $65 billion that the Biden administration has proposed for pandemic preparedness and response is really just the beginning. It is just a drop in the bucket of what we need to do to invest in a, pub a strong public health infrastructure, a strong public health workforce, and funding for vaccine development for current and future uh, threats to population health. Going back to Heidi Larson for one moment, you know, she wrote that immunizations are the biggest worldwide experiments in collectivism and cooperation in modern times. When we really consider that statement, it is a statement that tasks all of us to work towards having Americans and actually all members of the population on this globe vaccinated as quickly as possible so that we can move towards leveraging these remarkable fruits of scientific and governance and collective investment in our global population health. And I'll end there. Michelle, I was just gonna add one other thing there to say that, I mean, your call to action there around vaccine, addressing vaccine hesitancy is, central, not just to dealing with this pandemic, but to, uh, as a central pillar of pandemic preparedness, which is both in the public health measures and the vaccine measures that almost have to have a, a, a pre-positioned consciousness amongst the community that that is what is going to happen. Not that a hundred years on from the influenza pandemic, it all comes as a surprise and a Groundhog Day to the human race that oops, we do need to act collectively again. And what do we have to do when we have to act collectively? It's pre-positioning all of these assets from greater surveillance for these pandemic uh, viruses with pandemic potential, all the way to pre-positioning tools for dealing with vaccine hesitancy and vaccine distribution and and deployment. And I, I think that's the essence of where we are now. It's sort of, as you said, it's the time and it, it, we're at the time where this needs to be done without a question, not just for ourselves, but for future, future generations who will inevitably face pandemic viruses uh, in the future. I couldn't agree more. So I think, I think this is a composite slide that really summarizes many of the thoughts that have been expressed so far. Um, I think it's, it, it's all there on this slide. It's all actually in a way kind of straightforward. <laughs> we have to recognize these things. I don't know, Michelle or Michael, if you have anything to add to this, but it is moving, unfortunately, from pandemic that is not under control anywhere to an endemic and the potential of having a further pandemic in the future. Great points, Mark. The only thing we're, we would reiterate is that modeling and prior experience shows us that it will not convert from pandemic to an endemic until it's endemic for everybody. 
So it is in the US and other Western powers best interest to find clinically viable, safe and effective and low cost vaccines to uh, be brought to the world's poor, to low and middle income countries, as well as to the nooks and crannies of rich nations where people have not been vaccinated or do not have access to safe, effective drugs. So the second point is just, we are persistently in a reactive posture in our medical countermeasure uh, system. And that's not good. You're depending on being lucky and lucky is not a plan. For those of us that were there when Moderna was a four person company, we will tell you that the odds were against it. And the, co the company was carried along by extraordinary investment and was with lots of technologies brought to it to turn it into the amazing technology that it is. To a lesser extent, BioNT had a similar uh, journey. The point we're making here is had we had a pandemic two years ago, the rate of technology maturation for mRNA vaccines would not have existed. These are the 11th hour deliverables that came in just in time. Again, luck is not a plan. Coronaviruses are inherently easy to make vaccines against. And had this been pandemic influenza, we would have had a devastating and a even worse, uh, even a worse outcome than we had here. Yeah, and you know, Mark, I would add that the plan has to have a sense of urgency added to it. You know, we have um, we've done well in in moving um, migrating some of the surplus of vaccines to poor and middle income countries, um, but you know, in many places we still have not gotten close enough to the level of vaccination coverage that we need to, and so in addition to having a plan, we have to think and implement, we have to design and implement uh, delivery systems, vaccination programs that more rapidly get vaccinations in the arms of people across this globe. Because if we're not doing that, we are really making ourselves more vulnerable to the emergence of additional uh, variants that will threaten us all. It only takes eight hours for a new threat to circulate uh, the globe. And so we really have to operate and implement that plan with a sense of urgency that I haven't seen us really invest in as adequately as we can and should. I'm wondering, Andrea, if we should take questions at this point. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jump. I saw, I saw an important question about natural immunity, which is, it's very, it's very relevant. Uh, the uh, aspects of you know, natural immunity as an alternative. Well, natural immunity can occur from everything from not even knowing that you develop natural immunity to all the way to a near death experience during which you suffered from COVID-19 and just in time your natural immunity helped you to recover. So natural immunity, as we're understanding it in COVID-19, can run the gamut from very, very effective down to the point where you don't even know that you had the disease to basically you had the disease and natural immunity and you almost died. And I'm not mentioning the people who died, even <laughs> though they had evidence of natural immunity. So, yeah. so, 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 so the point being, and it's a very, very important point, and it's being thought about in the scientific community very deeply, is what is that level of natural immunity that we can say to people, well, you have natural immunity, and therefore you are protected. And the truth of it is that that actually in science takes a while, because there's a great variety of different aspects of the immune response that occur in natural immunity. It takes a while to find out what it is that's the key metric of natural immunity that actually does protect you from, in particular, um, severe disease and death. And I think that's very much in the wheelhouse of science at the moment to work that out, because once that is discovered, that will only add to our understanding of vaccination and vaccine design, and also where we can say um, your immunity is adequate at this point to be protected from mild, moderate, and severe disease. 
Mark, you raise some great points there. Just I, it's also helpful to look at the experiences of other nations that tried experiments of natural immunity to get them out of their debacle. In those countries, they either suspended those efforts and then aggressively pursued vaccines or reinstituted public health measures because that did not prevent long COVID. So the burden of that disease resulted in up to 30% of people impacted for 90 days, resulting in really long-term consequences for caregivers, for hospital care, and the resurrection or recovery of the economy. And the second, the second point is um, for those of us who work internationally is to understand to, that in those environments that allowed for natural immunity, the event that caused the infection allowed the propagation of high r naughts high transmission that you don't get with vaccines. So a vaccine doesn't result, you know, in propagation. So, you know, a propagation of any problems, but those events that conspire to generate, um, you know, herd immunity or convalescent immunity have come at an extraordinary high cost to healthcare and to the economy. So great points. And lastly, the, um, the vaccines are peculiar um, in how good they are compared to prior infections. You know, normally the survivor immunity was, is actually really good and very long lasting, not so in COVID. And the clinicians on this call have managed multiple people that are unvaccinated and have received series of COVID infections, sometimes with the second and third infection being worse than the first one. So though we definitely have a humility about you know, our lack of or short understanding of this virus. So great points all. Yeah, let me, uh, let me just um, respond to a couple of questions I'm seeing here. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things, one of the questions relates to safety profile. The safety profile of the, these COVID vaccines have just been phenomenal. I mean, we now have hundreds of millions of people around the globe vaccinated and the safety profile is phenomenally um, excellent. Of course, there are exceedingly very, very rare adverse effects, but there are few in the history of vaccines that um, have such a, a, a rapid growth of a proliferation of information that documents and support the safety profile. Um, I, I want to um, respond to a question around um, why it is important to um, practice empathy in describing and responding to vaccine concern and vaccine hesitancy. I think, I think it's important because uh, vilifying and humiliating those people who have real questions, it's real to them about the vaccines, should have a safe place to go to express their fear, to express their concern, to be heard, and then in the process of hearing the source of their concerns for thoughtful scientists, community health workers, uh, people in the members of the community who are knowledgeable um, about uh, public health, clinical medicine, healthcare, to respond, to provide a response that speaks specifically to the need of those members of our community who have questions and concerns or even fears about vaccine. You know, um, here in Boston, when Dr. Anthony Fauci made a visit to the Boston uh, Presbyterian Haas, um, um, Church in Roxbury, the people were over the moon appreciative that someone of a high governmental position, a scholar of you know, such high repute would spend time to actually sit and listen and engage with members of a community that is largely African-American, largely low income um, workers who were not the center of the conversation or the plan for addressing this pandemic in the beginning. And the impact that Dr. Fauci had by seeing, hearing, and responding to specific questions from members of the community did wonders for improving vaccine uptake um, in that local community. So it is important to listen, to be empathetic, and to engage with individuals who have real questions that can be addressed. I, I was going to add one thing because there have been some very, very interesting um, 
questions and uh, with a focus on policy here. I think that it's very common to develop a policy that one hopes is, you know, has some core blocks to, in this particular case, with regards to the aspects of vaccine development, surveillance, public health uh, components, equity, and so forth, that will stand the test of time. But there are also policy components that would have to be nimble and uh, reactive to what is going on. There's this question about areas that have been high, highly vaccinated previously, and there have been countries that have, been, have reached very high levels of vaccination, and yet there are still continued outbreaks and significant outbreaks to, to that point. I think the rolling nature of this pandemic actually requires the type of review that in a way these calls that we've been doing have been uh, have been active around which is where do we find ourselves now what is the see what is the same that we need to keep applying with regards to science and public health measures and what is new that we have to apply so it's an adaptable and adaptive system where the policy recognizes that we are in addition to having learned a lot there are still things we're learning that mean that we have to be nimble with where we direct resources as we move forward. I think there's another, just from a personal point of view, there's a question on vaccine hesitant individuals are teaching the scientific community is in a diverse population, there is a diverse reason yeah. for people being vaccine, diverse reasons why people are vaccine hesitant. And to, I, in my own personal experience, taking a, a, a one approach fits all is not going to work. It, it has to be, again, adaptable and responsive and sensitive and empathetic uh, in the context of healthy people contemplating having a vaccine and uh, in order to prevent a disease that they may not yet have experienced. And Michelle, do you, the, 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 it's a very important point there. It is a very important point. And that's why we have systems to really examine and evaluate the safety profiles of vaccines, right? Because the thought here is we're not providing uh, a therapeutic to someone who is already ill. We're talking about a, 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 a vaccine that is designed to prevent not only the spread of a pathogen, but also to save lives of those people in the communities who are vulnerable to that spread. So the profile and the process that one goes through, I, I will just quickly say, you know, the trials that brought forward the mRNA vaccines included tens of thousands of individuals and the most diverse participants in pre you know, authorization trials than we've had in, in, in history. And that profile of safety was established well before the authorization of the vaccines. And it was empirically done in evaluating how safe and effective these vaccines would be. There is assurance that the regulatory agencies are also considering post-marketing surveillance of these vaccines. So as millions of people are, are vaccinated, we have information that continues to grow empirically about how effective and safe these vaccines are. There's a couple of questions that I think we can glom together centering around how effective these vaccines could be against future variants. And I think maybe a way to think of that question, and Michael, you started to touch on it earlier, you know, there's, a, there's vaccines that we have today, and then there's ideal models for vaccines that could be useful for pandemics, new pandemics, new emerging infectious diseases, mutations, whatever that might also address some of these public issues of you know, decreasing hesitancy. So is there kind of a profile that we should be thinking about in terms of a vaccine that uh, obviously safe, as, as Dr. Williams said, but that can uh, <clears throat> maybe be more durable and reduce the, the rate of mutations? Is that something to be thinking about? And is 
Great, Patrick. So the good question. So the probably the biggest um, contributor to you know the the production of a broadly broad spectrum vaccine, one that would capture all variants, is to use the clinical truth. That means the human experience. Yes. The immune systems that we get in white mice are perfect for white mice, but they poorly translate to the experiences that we see in the human condition. So our response and our surveillance and our international collaborations at the scenes of pathogen emergence are not just humane and appropriate and collaborative. They allow us to maximize our lead time to look for the winning solutions of that rare individual that produced a perfect antibody that covered all variants, alpha, beta, epsilon, P1, Manas, delta, delta plus, those antibodies exist in the human space. The second contribution is we're getting pretty good at designing antibodies that uh, inside the computer and saying a virus of the future will be protected for this antibody. And in some really elegant work done in Asia, Europe, and here in North America, we are producing fake viruses of the future and proving that the antibodies that were manufactured on the computer are binding them. So groups like the VIC are getting very good at engineering antibodies for threats, not that are just current, but for threats that are near term and very, very likely. That's very helpful. Thank you. And, and I think we should touch on one more time, sort of the global cooperation question and, and how to best do that. I think we have uh, outlined uh, sort of what the dream would be. Uh, what, are, what are the first steps that can be taken, uh, Michael, in your opinion, and, and, and Michelle on that front? And what, what can the folks that are on the phone do to help support that? I, there's not formal contracts here. There's not formal treaties. This is this is folks getting together and being folks, I think. So I'll leave that to you, you guys. Great, so if I could be succinct on this, it's, you know, 10 years ago when I attended in China, I was still teaching. One year, two years ago when I attended in China as an infectious disease doctor, I was taught. So the, it, the world is flat in terms of the levels of medical innovation and the resources that I have to take care of a sick Chinese patient are so much vaster than I have in, in, than I have available in an American hospital. The, the dependence on sequencing, overnight sequencing, the uh, ubiquitous availability of MRIs, things that cost money and time here. So the point I'm making with the example is that it is truly collaborative now. There are no second place citizens in the modern Asia and the developing economies of South America. And as you develop rich middle or rich middle income or vast middle income populations, these nations develop very um, shrewd technologies for caring for people. And the important point is many of those technologies reemerge back into the West. Yeah. examples, beautiful examples from HIV, which we don't have time for. So if the, we need to get out there and we need something to offer. Quite frankly, the Americans need to up their game in collaborations by not making drugs and vaccines that are hard to give, like would require super mm -hmm. cold temperatures like our early COVID vaccines. They're comparatively useless for 6 billion other people, right? So we need drugs and vaccines produced in the US that have massive utility and clinical viability in foreign systems. Another example is that Western investment does not consider the need for halal vaccines. So are we leaving several billion Islamic uh, people in needs of these therapies off the list because of cultural and religious beliefs? That makes no sense. So smart money is on considerations that all markets are global, and while the delivery systems and the cost reimbursements are different, the disease and the pain and suffering is not. Yeah, let me, let me just add, Pat, that the global health security agenda requires that commitment of collaborating, transparency, and reckoning that the risk anywhere is the risk everywhere. The mm -hmm. threats to population health and global health and our global health security agenda 
Those risks cannot be mitigated, cannot be managed if we don't have global cooperation. So we have to find ways to collaborate and maintain an open channel of sharing what we know when we are surveilling the risks, when we are adapting responses to the risks like creating vaccines and distributing and disseminating the fruit of that innovation and research that brings about controlling a pandemic threat or managing the harms that climate change is affecting all of us. The locus of action has to be global. That's, that's a that's a key point to leave everybody with. So I thank you for that. And I know we're bumping up against it here. And for the questions that haven't been answered, we will certainly circle back with you via email or set up a call. Uh, I think just to sum it up, there's been a lot of lessons learned here. Systems that were in place and developing have slipped a bit and we need to make sure we're re-engaged globally. And our first shots across the bow here to control the virus with the vaccines have been well done and are indeed safe, um, but we need to message that perhaps a little better and build on what we learned there to build broader acting, more durable vaccines that people feel safe with. So I don't know if anybody would add to that quick summary, but um, if so, please do. Well, I think between what Michelle said and what you said sums it up very nicely. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much to our esteemed panel. Um, I, you know, it's it's always, it makes me feel good about the world. Not every day does that, but when I know that very, very committed and smart people are dedicated to uh, uh, certain causes and I, it makes me sleep better at night that we will come up with solutions for this. And I, I thank everybody who joined the conference call as well. We really appreciate your time. And as always, we're, we're available to answer questions or uh, address any uh, further concerns you might have. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for uh, G2G for getting this all set up and, and helping us with everything. Thank you. Terrific. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for your great thank questions. You. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you.